Welcome back to the show, everybody. Check out these headlines we have for you here. 429 million XRP, Flare Networks. We're going to talk about the Chinese yuan, Brazil, and tokenized credit notes, is it? <laughs> digital euro, and don't forget about the digital pound. We got BlackRock, Davos. We got XRP, XLM. How about XLM, Stellar, in the U.S. Treasury? How about Ripple going through the Treasury? How about somebody roll that beautiful intro? Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show, everybody. You can follow us on TikTok, YouTube, or Twitter for exclusive content. Right now, $1.03 trillion market cap. We're up 1.6% on the market. Bitcoin, 21,200 plus, up 23.5% on the seven day. Ethereum now, 1,500 plus, 18.9 on the seven day. We see Tether right now, 66.4 billion mark, uh, Four billion market cap, they say. XRP is thirty-eight cents. Eleven point one is where we are right now. If you haven't looked at it, ladies and gentlemen, crypto IRA, gold and silver two. It's I trust. Say it with me. I trust. Click the link below. I trust. Come on in. Yeah. 401 rollover. TSP 403B. You get it. There's so many options. It's incredible. Let alone they have staking available as well on the platform. Staking now live. Earn up to 9.5 APY. How about that? That's pretty amazing. Check out the link to the sponsor underneath the video. Right here, we see several chunks of Ripple linked crypto XRP have been sent with Binance as one of the participants moving over 429 million XRP in total. Good gracious, that's a lot. The largest chunk here carried an astonishing 210 million coins. I have to feel like it's on demand liquidity, but I can't prove it, but I like to show it to you. Flare Networks, want to remind you here, the Epic 3, the uh, the first Flare Networks Epic generating rewards for the Flare community is now underway. Congratulations, everybody. Along with that, we've launched our new Epic dashboard. See the new uh, current Epic and explore FTSO providers on Flarepedia and more to come. And by the way, you know, you can vote yes or no. I'm leaning in the yes region. Because then we have the option to control where the rest of the flare is distributed to. And I think that's a very, very key point to hold on to. So I'm anxious to see your comments underneath the video. So Chow Securities, ladies and gentlemen, look at this. This is big. Don't believe it. It's still true. A Chinese securities firm enabled the electronic digital Chinese yuan payments on its mobile application on Monday marking the first use case of the central bank digital currency in securities market trade. There we have it. I tell you, you know, things are moving much quicker than people really believe because they're constantly looking at price and not looking at the fundamentals and the real adoption being used in real industries and businesses. Perdesco's Brazil's second largest private bank launched its first tokenized bank credit note. Oh, a credit note, is it? Oh, that's interesting. Stay with us. We're not done yet. Oh, it gets better, ladies and gentlemen. Though the digital euro must be automatically convertible to the traditional euro at any point, the asset cannot be programmable so that holders are prevented from spending it on certain purchases or at certain times. Well... I agree with this, obviously, and I know most everyone hearing my voice agrees with this, too. But we're going to watch this closely because this is the danger, right? This is the dark side of digital money is that they actually can program it and make sure that you spend it, cut it off, say you've only got a certain time to spend it. You can't spend it if you're a certain distance away from your house. You can't spend it if you bought too many ham sandwiches or whatever it is, right? You know, these are the dark side concerns and we all should be concerned. But right now, it appears they're on the right page. We will continue to monitor it and see if it changes. Remember last summer, there was conversations where they were like, yeah, we shouldn't, but I think we're going to anyway. Well, at the moment, they're saying they know that they shouldn't. Well, let's see how long that lasts. This right here is coverage from over at Davos, where the World Economic Forum is holding their conference. And I want to show you this quick clip right here. Take a listen. 
Why should billionaires and oligarchs be developing policy, foreign policy, domestic policy, environmental policy, social policy, in secretive clubby meetings in Switzerland in some ski resort? Who gave them a seat at the table? And when they talk about global citizenship, who died and made Larry Fink the king? He's just a money manager. Since when did we elect him to write policies under which we all have to live? Listen here, I just... Look, I, I don't think you can ask a better, any better set of questions that were being asked right there. But I do know this, because it is weird, right, that the oligarchs and the billionaires and the Black Rocks and the Larry Finks of the world over there shaping policy globally. That's exactly what these things are for. Make no mistake about that. And if you're going to make no mistake about that, make no mistake about this. Brad Garling House is going to be there to help him do it. And he'll be speaking in two days at Davos, and I can't wait to see what he's going to say while he's there. Uh, for the umpteenth time, follow Michael Branch, and he's got this spot on here. XRP rival XLM turns green as commercial bank runs pilot program for new digital currency system. And look, we know about the Ukrainian banking giant working with the Stellar Network. I reported it on it just a few days ago. But the truth is, is it is exactly the way Michael Branch says here. They are not rivals, right? They're not rivals. So, and if even if they were, competition's great, right? So here, I want to remind you while we're talking about central banks and the like, let's talk about this because we covered it the other day. It's a fine time to bring it up again. Uruguay Central Bank registers Ripple Partner as money transfer company. That's what happened. <laughs> Oh, yeah, but it gets better. Stay with us now. Don't go nowhere. Nathan Price, another one you should be following. Stellar Development Foundation submits this letter for consideration by the U.S. Department of Treasury. Talks about coexistence of different digital asset types, CBDCs, stable coins, and digital assets alike. Consumer benefits if, uh, if different types of digital assets are interoperable, let's just go through this very quickly here. So here's the letter itself. And it is from August of this past year, just last summer. And I'm going to bring you right here to this. These solutions and products can be built on an open system to enable CBDCs to meet payment needs as they evolve. The CBDC should also be interoperable with cash, electronic money at a domestic and retail level. Goes on here to say, separate from CBDCs, the Stellar Development Foundation continues to explore and support development of interoperability between other non sovereign digital assets, for example, through multi chain technologies. Second, the private sector can and does play a useful role in addressing financial inclusion, particularly by reducing transaction fees, increasing speed, and expanding the availability of, of affordable consumer applications and financial services. It says here, through recent technolog technological advances, Stellar users can now plug into MoneyGram retail network with one integration, letting their user deposits or withdraw for cash from their digital wallets via Stellar and USDC without needing a bank account. That is how you bank the unbanked, isn't it? They finish it up here. In the years to come, different types of te uh, technologies and digital assets will come and go, coincide, overlap, and in some instances, interoperate with varying effects on federal ob objectives, for example, around financial inclusion, consumer protection, and systemic risk. There you have it. Now, we've talked about systemically important designations. I think XRP and XLM are poised for some kind of uh, designation like that in the future. I really do. Speculation, of course. But here we see, this is Jim Willie. Shout out to Working Money Channel and why he doesn't have 192,000 subscribers beyond me. I love what he does. And shout out to him. But listen to this quick clip here of Jim Willie. And I've had quite a few people send me messages say that he is spot on. So let's take a listen to what he says about XRP adoption coming and for the digital dollar. Well, in our situation now, it's impossible to stop within the same system, which means you've got to adapt and create a different system. And that's what's underway. The dollar is going to be phased out. <clears throat> XRP will become the basis of the new foundation for a period of time, like two years or so. And on the other side will be a digital dollar. Digital dollar is what Wall Street calls it, because they don't like to say a crypto t 
type of dollar. they rather call it a digital dollar. So isn't that interesting? XRP is going to be ushered in, but notice, guys, he did give a timeline for XRP, and when we're really going to see that value pop, he gives a two-year window. So I thought that was interesting, considering... I'm just going to break for a second here to bring you guys back to a video I did earlier this week where John Deaton was talking about if XRP got clarity for the next two years, what that would mean for this particular token and other tokens in comparison. Well, here it is right here. Shout out to Working Money Channel again for this. If you're not a Bitcoin maxi and own ETH or any other altcoin, you should care about XRP because what Judge Torres decides about XRP is likely the only clarity we get for the next two years. If she decides XRP is a security, it will embolden the SEC to come after other tokens. I remember covering it. Again, shout out to Working Money Channel. Give them a follow. But I tell you this, you know, the next two years, I think we get stable coin legislation before then and the ruling. But I think John Deaton is absolutely correct for any meaningful legislation for crypto as a broad sector of asset class, not digital assets or stablecoin, but crypto, I think it may be about two years. And that's quite interesting, isn't it? But I think stablecoin legislation could really bring a flood of investment into this market, flood of institutional money into this market, my personal opinion, not financial advice. But take a look at this, because Ripple is going through the Treasury, says the management of Treasury and Finance of Switzerland. Yeah, don't believe that. It's still true, they say. Not me. I'm just reading what they said. Right? They're breaking it down here. According to Ripple, transaction, four seconds. You see what goes on with all of this. You guys know the drill here, right? As opposed to Swift Network currently settling by netting systems, IBM and Ripple are in direct comp competition with Swift, such as Santander and SEB, as well as tech giants such as Google, already play a part of Ripple's, Ripple's platform, also as investors, which we know they were a seed investor. Blockchain Worldwire, IBM, co cooperating innovative tech companies coming from the payment environment. I think about what's happening here. Two contractual parties, listen to this. As soon as two contractual parties issue promissory notes to each other using the Ripple Net. Oh, I'm sorry. What did they call them? Promissory notes. What did David Schwartz used to call it? IOUs issued on the XRP ledger. See, this is why I've always been hung up when something is a note. And it, maybe it comes from an appeal. Maybe it doesn't come at all. Maybe someone speaks to the home and I'm going back. But I tell you this, if you call it something banks have been working with for a long time, then they won't need to change the regulation in order to keep using it. But if you call it something new, maybe even a stablecoin designation the way the World Bank sees XRP and XLM, maybe we get that legislation this year and that does the trick. I don't know, but I'm here for it. And this is looking pretty interesting to me. Let's keep reading really quickly here. Of particular importance here is the consistent consensus must be found in a network uh, between all participants in a transaction. It is therefore necessary for Ripple users to indicate whether others, other user they trust up and what amount to redeem the stored IOU. Okay, this is the language being used. But as far as Switzerland says, it goes through the treasury. Shout out to Mr. Man. Shout out to Crypto Dem for that. And then there's this, ladies and gentlemen. Let's finish on this. This is not Ripple Attorney. This is John Deaton, who represents 75, 76,000 XRP holders, ladies and gentlemen. Shout out to the field general himself. Damn right. And he says here, when it talks about why the SEC, uh, uh, people have been pondering whether the SEC would have a full out win, which is really hard to believe, right? But if you come here, he says, Ripple it's not Ripple Attorney, it's obviously XRP Holder Class Action Attorney, shared further insights why he believes the argument of the United States Securities Exchange Commission makes a case to grant Ripple Labs a victory in its ongoing case over the status of XRP tokens and coins. 
According to Deaton, the SEC claims that the XRP security at all times is proof that the Howey test has no simple definition, which makes its use in determining if an asset is a security arduous task. Deaton said about 3,000 amicus briefs submitted to the court, that is incredible, revealed that the first time buyers of XRP did not know Ripple Labs existed at all or had any influence whatsoever with the coin. Over the course of the lawsuit, which began in 2020, the SEC has drafted an expert testify against XRP. Deaton noted that the expert made an attempt to call the entirety of XRP community a common enterprise according to the provisions of the Howey test. A common enterprise is when the profits of the investor are combined and with and depend on the success of a third party or those selling the investment. Deaton said the claims are unfounded since the expert did not interview any XRP holder and the SEC did not include experts' position in its summary judgment. Now, that's a big piece right there. With all of the observations and discrepancies noted, John Deaton said here that he uh, that those who believe the SEC has a chance to win the case are overestimating the regulators' chances. People predicting the SEC will definitely win and that the XRP is doomed are overstating the SEC's chances. The SEC allegations are stretched too far. That's where we are right there, ladies and gentlemen. Not financial advice from me or John Deaton or anyone else. It's just our digital perspectives. I'll catch all of you on the next one.